Uh, well, uh, my name is uh, Miguel and this is Philip. We are working for Igalia and we are here to tell you about the work we have been doing during the last month, uh, which is basically uh, to adapt a browser to work properly in the Raspberry Pi and using, in this case, uh, Qt WebKit. So they, uh, we wanna, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the Raspberry Pi hardware, the, the features it has, and then uh, a bit about uh, the WebKit rendering. Uh, it, maybe it's boring for you, but we need to talk about the, a bit about how WebKit does the rendering in order to understand the benefits we are getting from the streamer. And uh, how we can optimize the, the rendering. And then uh, Phil will also present some uh, improvements for Qt WebKit related to the platform level. So as you know, the Raspberry Pi uh, is this awesome low-end hardware, very cheap, uh, with a quite slow processor, uh, which means that we cannot do software rendering at all. Uh, it's not viable, but it has a quite capable uh, video processor. It's a video core 4 with dual core uh, GPU, and it has uh, 512 megabytes of RAM that is split between normal RAM and video RAM. Uh, for the record, we split it in 256 chunks uh, in our, our tests and also has a quite capable uh, GLS and EGL implementation. So it's quite, quite powerful in order to perform rendering. So our goal uh, will be to use OpenGL as much as possible for the rendering. So this is. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So a few words about the OpenMax distributor elements uh, <coughs> that we are using on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, there are there's hardware decoding support for uh, the most, well, some video formats, H.264, VP8, and uh, Tera. Um, the decoders are able to uh, output uh, buffers uh, in e EGL images so that it can be later rendered uh, by the video syncs. Uh, more details about that later. Um, another thing, the custom audio syncs. Uh, specific for the uh, Raspberry Pi using the MMAL uh, abstractions. Um, these things are quite nice because sometimes we, you don't really need to have Pulse Audio uh, for embedded uh, usage. So you can just use, uh, do the audio path through directly to HDMI or the analog output. And all these elements are really well integrated in, uh, in Playbin. Which, we, which is what we use in WebKit, as you, as you know uh, from the last talk. Um, yeah. Well, as you see, he's explaining the GStreamer part, and I'm explaining the rendering part. <laughs> so don't ask me about GStreamer. He's the expert. Uh, so the goal of the project. Uh, we were asked to have a full-featured, full-screen browser with no tabs and with no window manager. And uh, we should be able to, to, well, we should focus uh, on using web applications that are centered on media rendering, and especially, especially in, in the use case of YouTube TV. We should use OpenGL for rendering, as we commented, and uh, we should use Qt, uh, Qt5 as a platform. This was not our decision, by the way. Uh, so as we need to use Qt5 and we don't want uh, we need a full screen browser, we will be using the ELFS uh, platform abstraction from Qt. And uh, that makes the, the work quite transparent. So, a bit of rendering. Uh, basically, this is the sim very simplif simplified the process that uh, WebKit does for rendering. So, we have there the HTML code, which is parsed into, into a DOM tree, which you know is this tree with all the components. And for the, uh, on the other side, you have the style sheets, which gets also parsed, and you have the, a, a set of rules. And then those rules are mixed with the DOM tree. Uh, this is called the attachment process in web, inside WebKit. 
and uh, that gives us the render tree, which is another tree uh, with the elements, uh, with the properties uh, that's almost ready to be rendered. Uh, also, uh, from that tree, and when we have the sizes, positions, and such of each of the elements, we can get the final layout we are going to use. Then that render tree is painted and then set into the display. This is quite easy, at least at this point. Because I mean, a bit more complicated when there are more trees. So, as we said, there is a DOM tree with the HTML elements that get converted into the into render objects for the render tree. Now, as you know, there are several layers on, on a web page. So, we need to split those objects into layers because they are going to be uh, rendered separately because, and, or, and, and ordered because we need to render them first the, the, layers, the layers below you, then your layer, and then the, the layers over you. So we have uh, we assign those objects to their layers, and we have another another tree which is the render layer tree. And then uh, some of those layers are going to need to have a buffer to to write to, and some others don't. For example, you have two layers with with static uh, elements; they don't need to have two different buffers to to be painted on. We, they can be painted in the same buffer. But for example, if you have uh, an animation over a static item or a, lay a layer that needs to be uh, drawn with transparency uh, that needs to be set, uh, written or drawn in another buffer and then that buffer must, to be, must be put over the first one. So uh, here where is when the, these graphics layers appear and they are basically those, those render layers that need a buffer are, uh, have a graphics layer. So then, uh, after these graphics layers are, are drawn, we have a set of layers that need to be composite uh, one on top of each other to get the final result in this compositing process. And then the, the result is put into, into the display, and that will be the, the web page. So this is more or less understandable. It's quite uh, intuitive. And then. How this, is, this process is, is done in Work with One? Because you know there are differences between Work with One, Work with Two. Work with One is kind of deprecated, it's the past. Uh, we are focusing on Work with Two now. But as uh, the rendering, rendering Work with One is kind of a subset of what happens in Work with Two, it makes sense to explain it a bit. So, as, as I said, uh, the graphics layers, when we are rendering with OpenGL, each graphics layer is going to be backed by a, by a GL texture. Uh, the video, the video player is going to be, uh, it's going to have its own graphics layer because it's a, a layer that has to be uh, updated independently of the other layers. Also, it can have transparencies as well and such. And then, as I said, uh, the the render layers, the render layer tree is traversed to, uh, and as all the layers are asked to be painted, uh, following the order. First, the, ch the children below you, then. The, the layer, then the children above. And uh, finally, the graphics layers are uh, stacked to produce the final result. This is done by a class that is called the Texture Mapper, which is, if you read a bit about rendering, it's quite known. Uh, so, this becomes a bit more complicated in WebKit 2. Because WebKit 2 uses two processes to do the render. It has the web process and the UI process. Uh, basically, Almost everything that happens in WorkKit One, uh, which is traveling the, the render the render layer tree and drawing each of the layers, happens in the web process. Then those graphics layers, remember that in this case those graphics layers are uh, GL textures. They need to be taken to the UI process to be composite, so to stack them and uh, to be shown on the screen. So uh, the trick here is that the rendering happens in the web process, and then the graphics layers uh, are taken to the UI process using a class that is called a graphic surface. And the graphic surface is a method to encapsulate uh, mm, encapsulates our platform-dependent way of sharing GL texture without needing to copy them, the, to share them among processes. By the way, oh, I was forgetting that. 
So, in this case, uh, we are using EGL images. Uh, I'm not sure if you know how EGL images work, but basically it's a kind of a, a obscure global element uh, that it's, you can draw a texture in one process, assign it to an EGL image, it will get stored somewhere in a global memory address, and then in another process you can reference that EGL image uh, and assign it to a, one of your textures, and magi magically it will be, the, your texture will be updated with the contents of the EGL image, and you don't have to worry about copying anything. So, this is the process uh, in WebKit 2 for rendering a frame. Basically, the UI process asks for a new frame. The web process renders all the layers, and each of the graphics layers, remember the graphics layers are those that have a, a buffer, I mean, in this case, a texture. So all each la graphics layer with, uh, has to have to create a graphics surface and copy their content into it. So uh, I have rendered it. I am a layer. I have rendered my content. Now I have to copy it inside the graphics surface so it can be used in the UI process for the composite. So we create a set of uh, graphics surfaces that are then shared with the web process. Well, but this, these graphics surfaces are, are composed and then we compose a state class which is sent, which is what is really sent to the, to the UI process through a socket. And then the UI process takes uh, these, those graphics surfaces and draws, draws the, composites their contents. Uh, as I mentioned there, that is done by a texture mapper. It's basically what happened in the working one, but in working one, the, composited, well, the compositing was done over the, 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 render, the graphics layers, and in this case, it's done with the graphics surfaces. But it's, it's almost the same. Think, as the, think as the, of the graphics surfaces as remote objects, like containers for remote objects. And that's it. So, I think. Yeah, well, so that's all about rendering, and now yeah. comes a, 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 a bit more of GStreamer. Yeah, so let's talk about the media player. Um, in this class di diagram, you can see on the, on the left side uh, the high level uh, classes representing a media element, uh, which has two subclasses, one for video, one for audio. And uh, these classes basically implement the, the specification, uh, the DOM interface of the elements. And these objects act, act as a client to a media player uh, which is able to basically, depending on which platform you are running, it's able to select a, a private, uh, private uh, player. For instance, on Linux, you'll get a GStreamer player. On Apple, you'll get an Apple-specific player based on QtKit or AV Foundations. And on Windows, there is another player, and so on. So um, the player which is based on GStreamer is basically using Playbin. Uh, and uh, and mo about video rendering, um, so let's talk about the inefficient way first, and then we'll see how we have improved that. Uh, so what the worst case that can happen is that the sync will negotiate some RGB format or XRGB, and um, it will do um, a buffer copy before rendering and passing the buffer to the player, which will do the actual rendering. So that's one buffer copy. Uh, but it's optional because uh, in some cases we, we don't need to do it. Uh, we don't need to do that conversion to the carrier uh, uh, alpha premultiplied uh, format. And uh, once the player, the sorry, once the buffer is passed to the player, uh, there's uh, a data transfer uh, of the buffer to a web core specific uh, class called bitmap image, and uh, so that's another copy. <laughs> and that image is rendered using a, a QPix map in Qt WebKit. In the GTK port, it's done differently, of course. Uh, it's specific to the port. And there is another approach, uh, which is the texture upload uh, meter that's supported by the sync. Uh, but, but that thing is basically doing a CPU to GPU uh, transfer. So 
it's not really efficient uh, either. We support it, but um, uh, it's not really uh, what we would like to have in the end. So that any inefficient rendering is yeah. <laughs> Well, back to the rendering part uh, for a while to comment how this works and how this is rendered. Basically, uh, we are talking, he explaining here just the, the video layer at this point. We are forgetting about the rest of the layers. Uh, so basically, when, when we want to put a video on, one, on a layer, that graphics layer will instantiate a, a media player and we will use it to grab the, the frames. So when the UI process asks for, ask for an X frame, uh, the layer, need, in order to render, the render itself, need, need, needs to get the, go to the decoder <coughs> and get the, the frame. But the frame we, will be in main memory, and we need it in video memory, so we need to do a copy there. And with that, we have killed like 1,000 kit kittens already. That, has, that cannot be done. And also, uh, then we, if you rem remember, then the graphics layer, once it's rendered, it needs, to be copy, it needs to copy its content into a graphics surface, so we need to do a texture copy there, which is something we would like to avoid as well. So we should, be, we should not be doing that upload and that copy. Besides that, once the, the frame is stored in the graphics surface, the rendering is already, it's already open here, everything, and that's not a problem. So. Phil. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's, now let's explain how we improved that. Um, so we made the sync actually support the EGL image meter so that uh, the decoders that are able to write uh, decoded data to an EGL image can actually negotiate with the sync and pass the, the data directly to the sync without any copy. Uh, we also added a buffer pool and image allocator, like in, EG, like in the GL image sync. It's basically more or less the same code. Uh, so we behave like the G e GL image sync uh, in that way. Uh, so the sync is able to allocate images and the decoders write directly to it. And the EGL images are basically encapsulated in a buffer um, and the buffer is passed to the player. And uh, that's, uh, that, that's then rendered uh, by the player. Um, but depending on which port you are running, it's, if it's WebKit 1 or WebKit 2, there are different uh, approaches, like Miguel. So with those changes in the, in, in the sync, we now find the same situation that before. But when we have to get the frame, uh, it's not in my memory. Uh, Actually, we are not getting the frame, but we are getting an AGL image that contains the frame, which is awesome because that AGL image is exactly what we want to take to the UI process. So we don't need to, to upload the frame to video memory and such. Forget about that. Just grab the AGL image from the decoder. And also, we don't even need to, to copy the layer content into the graphics surface because the graphics surface is going to generate an AGL image to, so it can be used on the UI process. Instead, we just tell the, the graphics interface to use that EGL image we already got from the, from the decoder. So we are uh, avoiding completely uh, any copy of the frame at that point, which is awesome. And then on the, on the UI side process, the, that, that EGL image is just uh, composite with the rest of the layers. There is a small trick here uh, which we faced. That is that the EGL image, uh, as, as I said, is a shared object. So the decoder is using several buffers uh, with several, several EGL images to, to put the frames there. So it might be the case that when you get the EGL image and take it to the UI process, in the meanwhile, the decoder might, or the sync, might be able to edit the contents of the, of the texture you are trying to put, put in, uh, draw, drawing a new frame. So it might be the case that you are drawing, trying to draw frame 13 while the decoder has already modified the EGL image and put there frame 15, so you are actually putting a wrong frame there. Uh, we, we found that problem and we have to add some locking on the, on the buffers of the decoder 
uh, to avoid that uh, an EGL image to be reused while we haven't been able to render the, fr the frame, actually. But that's a simple trick that uh, forces us to add that locking and also increase a bit the, the size of the, of the buffer pool of the, of the video sync. So um, that's all about video rendering, basic, basically. Uh, another thing, another task we worked on was improving media resource loading. Uh, as you might know, uh, in WebKit, we have a custom HTTP source element that's able to reuse uh, all the WebKit uh, resource loading infrastructure. But uh, depending on which port you use, uh, uh, some kind of uh, platform in, uh, dependent uh, interface will be used. So in WebKit GTK, we use LibSoup. And in Qt WebKit, we use uh, a cute resource loader, basically. So, but that resource loader has some issues. Um, we, we found out that it's loading, uh, uh, when you play a large video, it's loading everything as fast as it can. And uh, on a device with limited memory, like the Raspberry Pi, uh, the browser will crash with uh, out of memory. So uh, that's, that's a bug on, on the cute side. Uh, and uh, we decided to uh, leverage the libsoup resource loader that's already used in, in WebKGTK. Uh, and it's more integrated in WebCore. Uh, it's leveraging the cache, the cache mechanism in WebKit. And uh, it's well maintained by the WebKGTK folks, and uh, it works really well. So we decided to hook into that re libsoup resource loader. And um, also, uh, that resource loader is quite well integrated in the HTTP source element uh, because um, it allows uh, the source element to pre-allocate uh, the buffers. So uh, that will be less uh, memory copies uh, down the pipeline. Um, another thing we worked on a bit is related with WebRTC and get user media. Um, as you, do, as you know, it's done better than the yogurt telephone now. So <laughs> uh, we worked on the local device listing and playback. Uh, that's basically the self-view that uh, Robert showed in the WebRTC talk. A um, few words about how you use um, this API from the web application side. Um, in JavaScript, there is a, call, uh, a function called getUserMedia. And it's uh, asynchronous, and it's uh, uh, when the user will allow um, access to the device, uh, a success callback will be invoked. And uh, if something bad happens, a failure callback will be called. So in that success callback, we can basically attach uh, the media stream that's returned by the get user media. We can attach that stream to the uh, video element or an uh, audio element and uh, switch to play and pause. So that's a nice thing for the self-view. Uh, but then uh, for the, if you want to chat with someone, uh, you need to like, encode the data and payload it and stream it to the other side. So we, we want to have a flexible pipeline uh, that would allow to late, later uh, plug uh, RTP elements for the encoding. And on the Raspberry Pi, there's that device called RPCAM. Um, and in, on the GStreamer side, we have a source element that's able to, uh, it to uh, uh, collaborate with that device. And, and um, it will emit on its source pad uh, H.264 by its stream. Um, so that's really nice because Everything we explained about basic uh, video playback before can be reused here for the local device rendering. And uh, we can have a simple pipeline uh, that you can see that would pass uh, the H.264 stream and decode it and send it directly to the sync. And that's quite efficient on the Raspberry Pi, actually. And for the streaming uh, that we want to support later on, we would need a T element that would uh, split the stream and, and set it to the RTP encoders and payloaders. 
but that's going to be f uh, some work for the future. Uh, it's not done yet. Another thing uh, we wanted to talk about is web audio. Uh, that's a specification, uh, uh, W3C specification now. Um, it's used by uh, web apps to basically generate sound um, and uh, do uh, audio processing from the application. It's really useful for games and uh, for applications like uh, uh, for musicians. It's by pipeline based, like GStreamer. The, uh, the spec is quite uh, big, actually. There are a lot of elements uh, supported. There are, you can see a few of them here. Buffer source, it's like a source element, uh, as you can guess. Gain node with, uh, and we have nodes that would modify uh, the inputs and output that to, to the uh, outputs. And destination is like a sync, basically. And there is also that thing called uh, add related transfer function uh, that allows a web app to um, trick the human ear uh, into special sounds, like a 3D sound. Uh, that's really useful for games, like uh, when you are attacked by someone in an in a RPG game, uh, from behind you can hear the sound like it would from behind. So it's really nice, actually. So on the GStreamer side, uh, for web audio, we basically need to decode some incoming files uh, that would be requested by the web applications or the, uh, the web audio backend itself. Uh, there's a first scenario for local files. Um, we basically use decode bin there and the uh, app sync that would um, uh, kind of translate uh, the GST buffers to um, uh, PCM data stored in float arrays that would then be injected into WebCore for all the processing uh, internally. And the second scenario is for memory buffer, so we use GIO here, there and decode bin again. So. But we didn't do any uh, optimization related to uh, uh, the RSB Pi there. It was working already quite well. Um, and then for playback, uh, once all the data has been processed in WebCore, uh, we want it to, to air from the sound card. So we use a pipeline uh, for playback. And we have built um, custom source elements that would uh, transform the web core buffers, uh, the web audio core buffers, into GST buffers and uh, emit them on, on the source pad of the elements. And uh, yeah, again, uh, we didn't do any optimization related to the, the Raspberry Pi. So you might, you might wonder why, what, did, what we did improve. As a few slides ago, I mentioned the ad related transfer function, ArchRTF. Um, we, we found out that the loading of that database was taking a lot of time on the Raspberry Pi, so we needed to optimize it. On WebKit's side, that uh, database is stored in a lot of very small web, web files, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> the, um, the way we, the, the backend is implemented is that uh, during the loading of that database, uh, a lot of pipelines were created, one for each file. So we, we found out that concatenating all the small files into big, uh, one big file and then reading it would uh, improve the, the loading of the database. So yeah, it's basically two, from 240 calls and pipelines to only one. And uh, that was a big step forward. And um, we also did some experiments with the uh, fast Fourier transforms, um, which is used quite a lot in web audio. Um, on the Raspberry Pi, that's, uh, well, the default pipe uh, backend is based on GSTFFT, which is itself uh, using KISS FFT. But uh, yeah, that's not really performing that well on the Raspberry Pi. We, we did some profiling and uh, the, the math functions were quite uh, hot on, on, uh, on the device. Uh, and also the, the CPU of the Raspberry Pi being uh, ARM V6 is not really helping a lot. It's quite an old uh, architecture. So. 
not really performing that well. Uh, but there is that uh, thing called GPU FFT uh, library, which is uh, available in, in the Raspberry Pi user land. Uh, that's basically using the GPU to do all the, fast, the FFT transformation. And it's quite fast. Um, but the major inconvenience is that uh, it allocates uh, memory, which is quite uh, uh, needed already by the browser. And uh, as you know, the memory is already split by the CPU and the GPU. So it's 500 megabytes. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, we, we wanted to, like, to, to spare that memory for the uh, browser itself. Uh, so we kind of uh, gave up for now on that experiment. Um, that's it. So, yeah. Yeah, well, regarding the, the future tasks, uh, there's something we have, in, we have pending from a while ago, which is integration with video canvas and video WebGL, which means that uh, we need to enable a path to get uh, video frames inside the canvas in case we want to apply some kind of transformation there and, or let them uh, accessible to the users. And also the same in WebGL, uh, which is it's kind of a, it's, it's a task related to share the appropriate textures in the same context. It shouldn't be too challenging, but uh, we are working on other things currently. Yeah, and we also plan to continue working on WebRTC. As you know, there is the web, open web RTC framework that's been released recently. So we, we would like, really hope to leverage the new framework and, uh, and use it for the Raspberry Pi. It's really exciting work. And we, we look forward to collaborate with other people on, on that task. And um, yeah, also maybe we're thinking about the ORC. Uh, v 6 backend that could maybe be re revived. For right now it's disabled uh, because I think it's not really well maintained or tested at all. So well, we were thinking maybe about uh, improving that backend or do some work related with that. Um, now we have some demos. Um, so this is a demo showing YouTube TV. Uh, it's, it's working quite well, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> on the top left corner, you can see the, the, the frame rate. The frame rate, which is not that bad, actually. Um, we wanted to prepare a demo with the uh, inefficient way, but it, it wasn't really working at all. <laughs> uh, <coughs> sorry, we didn't get that video. Um, and another video, which is done in, in full HD. Um, the frame rate is a bit lower, but uh, it's still acceptable around 30 FPS. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically YouTube TV on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, there are some challenges still uh, related with, like in YouTube TV, you can keep the video in the background and still navigate in the UI. And that presents some challenges. Uh, related mm. with performance and uh, keeping a high frame rate uh, in the background while still being able to navigate in the UI is, uh, is an interesting uh, challenge to accomplish. Uh, so that's it. Actually, that, that work was, um, is publicly, publicly available on GitHub. And we, we collaborated with a company called Metrological on, on that project. And um, yeah, we, we plan to continue the work. And uh, actually, the, um, the video rendering improvements uh, that we did for Qt WebKit are also uh, valuable for WebKit GTK. So we plan to upstream that. And with that company, we also have been working on, uh, on um, like experimenting with a new, uh, new WebKit port, uh, but dedicated to Wayland. So there's, there's a interesting yeah. work. Really. Well, regarding that, do you know uh, WebKit is, is not uh, in the WebKit repository anymore, and it's maintained by, by DJ in the Qt, in the Qt uh, repository, but it's, not going, it's going to be 
out of there for Q4, I think, uh, because they are focused on, on Blink now and this is their, their Qt web engine. So we, we've been trying to, to convince uh, the, the company, this meteorological company, to stop using Qt WebKit and switch to WebKit GTK. And so another one of, uh, of our colleagues is working, uh, doing that port for the Raspberry Pi using WebKit GTK uh, and trying to achieve uh, the same or even better results. And also one thing, uh, that there's a thing called build root there on GitHub as well. So you can use it to basically build a, a root file system for the Raspberry Pi, and it will generate a tarball that you can basically write to the SD card, and, and you could test that yourself if you want. Uh, that's it, I think. If you have yeah, we, we actually, we have a, a demo of the Raspberry Pi there. Uh, and if it wants to boot, uh, it will show uh, a video rendering. It's a full HD video. Mm, let's hope it boots because the SD cards aren't quite trustable. No, well, it doesn't want to boot now. And uh, we have a slide with the well. release. So. <laughs> We knew what it was. Uh, uh, well, that probably it, wa it wasn't going to work. So that's why we we made the videos. Uh. Yeah, it was better to have a prepared video. <laughs> okay, that's the one about now. Okay, and do you have any question or comments or anything? Or you just want to go have lunch already? <laughs> yes. You build good things. Uh, so yeah, the question is about the build, build root changes. So we basically added some new packages uh, to our fork, and uh, we we tweaked some of the recipes for some packages, and uh, we updated some with new versions of Gstreamer WebKit. And uh, we might be able to upstream some of the recipes uh, for some applications we packaged. Uh, we yeah, it should be easy to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Ah, you are one of the build root. Okay. Ah, okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice work. Uh, anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.